own your own story. So remember the injunction yesterday to draft or come prepared today uh, with a version of your story, ideally no longer than 400 words, so that we can all take part in a collective learning exercise of co-developing or honing our own story further. And to get us started on this workshop um, is the wonderful Lisa Freeman. Next door. Good morning. It's great to see everybody again today. Um, I'm just going to kind of jump right into it, and I'm going to start by telling you all part of my story. My family recently acknowledged the 24th anniversary, not one that we celebrated, but the anniversary of the day that we were all impacted by a catastrophic error, a error that changed our lives forever. On that day, at a prestigious um, teaching hospital, I think we can advance the slide, my husband who was 37 years old, Rory, went in for what the surgeon told us would be a routine operation. It was going to be a decompression of the spine, and it was expected to take about six or seven hours. Unfortunately, after I said good luck, I love you in the morning, somewhere after the surgery began at 7 o'clock, the surgeon lost his way. Apparently, he couldn't find what he was looking for. He was operating at the wrong levels. Uh, he caused significant blood loss, and after 18 hours in the operating room, the patient, Rory, my husband, a father, a son, an entrepreneur, a smart, really funny guy, was brought to the ICU. Later, we were discovered he was paralyzed from the waist down. He had suffered brain damage. And a few days beyond that, we learned that he had developed a cervical site infection, and he required yet another surgery. He agreed it, and after several more, and had, he had several more surgeries as time went on. That day changed our lives forever. He suffered great trauma to his body. It impacted his whole person, not just his back, but his very being. For him, every day after that was a struggle. It was filled with intractable pain and many obstacles. But he was really strong-minded and very strong-willed. Came up with ways to do things that he used to do just differently. He retrained his body, and eventually he did get some healing back in his leg. And over the course of a couple of years, through countless hours of physical therapy, he was able to stand and then even walk a little bit. His thinking improved a little bit too. What are you going to do with this one? Um, his thinking improved a little bit too, and he did a lot of his own brain training. And he did a lot with therapists and worked really, really hard. But much of his time was spent getting around in a wheelchair, using the trapeze to move around in his bed because he couldn't do things that we all take for granted. And it required so much effort and so much time for him to do. His pain never went away. In fact, over the years, it got worse. Over the years, he developed many chronic so many chronic conditions as a secondary consequence of his acquired injuries. After 18 years, he passed away from respiratory failure, congestive heart failure, and kidney failure. That was the sum total consequence of the spinal cord injury that he suffered during surgery so many years after. His story and his ultimate death were the consequence of a medical error. There's also the story of our children, who were eight and three at the time. There's also my story as well. Frankly, all of his friends, relatives, colleagues, and acquaintances were impacted by his medical error. Worry no longer had the energy or the capacity to focus on everyday activities and social events that we all participate in without giving it a second thought. He was exhausted just from getting through each and every day. Our children lost their dad, but they also lost their mom too. Was part of me because I had to take care of him 24 7. I lost my partner and my soulmate, who I shared so much with, and now I was a full time caregiver for. Everything that happened to Rory affected more than just Rory. His children were not able to play with him, they couldn't play catch, um, they couldn't do the everyday things. My son would throw a ball to him, and when Rory missed it, 
from his wheelchair and until we go and retrieve it, hand it to him so he can throw it back to my son. We weren't able to camp it with the kids as we did go before they were born and were looking forward to doing after they got a little bit older. He couldn't work again. His excellent memory was diminished and his thinking was now much slower. If I can focus on one lesson from his life, it would be in all the years that I provided care to him, he and I were the glue that held his care together. No one provider had an overall perspective that only we the family could have. With all the medical expertise that the providers held, it was imperative that we were included in part of all the decisions. It can't be overstated. Patients and their families are the most underutilized resource in all. To say that from bad things often come, they say that from, from bad things often come good. Since Rory died almost five and a half years ago, I have been deeply involved in patient advocacy. I hope that I can take my experience and improve patient safety and the delivery of health care amongst my many activities. Currently, I'm now the Executive Director of the Connecticut Center for Patient Safety. I have chosen to make my primary mission the empowerment of patients and the patient voice in health care. Through telling his story, our story, I am able to share so many lessons that I learned. Through effective storytelling, you will be able to share your personal stories, the hard lessons learned, and the insights that you have gained to impact your audience in ways that data and statistics just can't. There are many lessons and experiences that can be shared in stories because they tug at people's hearts and people's souls. Sometimes they reach out and make a connection that might otherwise not happen. And that would really move your cause forward. My organization and I use stories as the basis for many of our discussions. We start many of our presentations, almost all of them, with the patient story. We use stories when we speak to and work with healthcare providers, when we meet with legislators, and when we educate patients. And we also use our stories to tell our stories when we meet with the media. They are very, very powerful tools, and they come from good. story like Lisa's that you just heard. And how many of you don't believe that Lisa became such an expert storyteller overnight? <laughs> Did she just wake up one morning be, and be able to unspool a narrative like that? <laughs> well, did, it, did it just come out unvarnished gold? No, it's an iterative process. And like reading helps writing, like listening helps telling, the process of developing a story takes time and it takes revision, it takes editing, it takes honing. Um, so that's part of the message of today. If you take nothing more away from our session this morning. It's the permission to work with your story over time and to become your own best editor of your story, which can be hard, like listening to your own voice and like becoming fluent speaking in front of people that you don't know. Telling your story becomes easier with time. And if you start looking at what are some of the common elements of an effective story, you can become even more of a craftsperson in using your story to advance what your purpose is. So let's dive in if we can to just some of those uh, components of an effective story. And to help guide that, I have a worksheet here. Um, While that's going around, I'll just share with you um, some of the background from which uh, the storytelling craft uh, comes from, and some of the components of storytelling 
crafting. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And as many of you know from experience, being able to tell a story effectively dramatically improves the rate at which you get in the door and get taken seriously. And I said it yesterday, and I'm going to say it again. Particularly when it comes to policy change, we have a particular barrier and a particular opportunity. The movement for patient safety and for senior recognition, awareness, prevention, and treatment is a women-led movement. If anything doesn't drive that point home, just look around the room today. Let's, re let's remember and celebrate the power that comes from teamwork um, and that sisterhood is a really indispensable part of this teamwork. But when it comes to policymakers, we often face a majority male environment. Still, in most parts of the country, in almost every state legislature, we still deal with more than 70, 75, sometimes even more than 85 percent male lawmakers. So the need to tell stories, to break through whatever barriers of distrust, of cynicism, it really relies on storytelling to make that crack and to gain access and oftentimes to build what Gloria Stein likes to call a bridge of empathy. Empathy alone is not enough. We need to have a lot of other components, and uh, some of those are laid out here. But in building that bridge, in getting the crack in the door, in moving beyond cynicism or distrust, or even just uh, root uh, ignorance about this disease or others that we're fighting, we have to tell stories to make that entree. So, what are some of the key ingredients in an effective story? Well, there are three crucial ingredients, and two that can help really make the dish more delicious. <laughs> Any good story has to be concrete. Notice the importance of Lisa asking to have the image of the hospital, the teaching hospital, put on the screen for you to visualize. Notice the importance of Lisa beginning her story, classic use of effective imagery, to show the face of her late husband. It's concrete. Not only can you see the person, but you can see and sometimes feel the place being described in a good story. It is a concrete place. You can touch it, you can visualize yourself there, you can sometimes convey your auditor to that location or to the texture of it, whether it involves the sterile feeling of a hospital hallway, whether, it, whether it's the nervousness of waiting in a waiting area as an operation is going on, whether it's that notion of the surgeon's hand going in at the wrong level, of the marathon treatment that he endured, um, you can picture yourself in that scenario. And that is a classic ingredient of a good story. Another key ingredient of a good story is personal vulnerability. I happened to have the occasion just two weeks ago to see uh, Aretha Franklin perform. And it was really noteworthy that this legendary Grammy winning performer um, who hails from my home state of Michigan, um, is also a great storyteller. And she had a moment in her performance where she had the audience already very disposed to liking and cheering raucously for her in the palm of her hand when she talked about her own near-death experience on a hospital bed back in Michigan in 2010. And she talked about reaching the point of near willingness to die and then bolting back and determining that she wanted to live and the joy of coming back from that brink of desperation and resignation and it was very powerful that a shift happened in the audience of several thousand people when she talked about her own intense vulnerability and the willingness to be vulnerable the willingness to admit 
fragility or weakness or to convey in the course of a story your own sense of uncertainty is a key part of a compelling narrative. So don't be afraid to be vulnerable. It is part of what builds a very effective and sturdy bridge of empathy with your listener. Number three, tie it to an issue. Some kind of policy, matter, or a decision. If it's imminent, if it's something that's immediate, that makes it even more compelling. So make it relevant, essentially. But make it of public relevance so that the story is tied to an anchor of a contemporary relevant issue, whether that's legislation, regulation, um, an election. Those are the kind of things that make a story very poignant. And then, you know, if you wanted to make it a really compelling story, you can add a sense of urgency to it where people can understand why the story matters. Why does the story matter in any given context? Or why does it matter now? How does it help drive or inform action? On their part, that can add urgency. And brevity, if you can hone that story, if you can do what Lisa did rather invisibly in her own story, which was take a three-page narrative and essentially boil it down to a page and a half as she read it, you've done something else. You've made a story compact, and you've made it understandable and readily, to not to use a bad pun around seated, digestible. <laughs> so brevity really makes a story, especially involving healthcare, where some of us have an extra degree, or policymakers, or people who regularly deal with public-facing roles or hearing stories, or discriminating listeners, you might say, have an extra degree or an extra hurdle of distrust or of, uh, of disapprobation, you might say. Not disdain, but of something, a membrane that separates them from you. And that is of the complaint, of the healthcare complaint. So many, so many of us know that a story about healthcare, almost like watching an icon from your computer be put from desktop into trash, when it involves healthcare or a sad saga involving healthcare, often makes that journey invisibly in the eyes of the listener when it involves a difficulty or a barrier involving healthcare. So, especially involving healthcare, I would say that number five may not necessarily be an optional component of a good narrative, it may be an essential component of a narrative involving healthcare or C. diff infections particularly. So making it brief and avoiding that disposition of a listener to take that complaint and just file it away under healthcare grievance is very, is an important thing to remember. So why do stories matter so much? Why does Lisa take the time to craft the story? Why has Lisa developed the story of her late husband and of caregiving for him and of telling that beginning, middle, and end? That suffering of waiting and of the loss of capacity and the diminishment of Rory's life that she took the time to tell through relational stories involving her son, involving his relationship with the workforce, and I think really beautifully and subtly, and one of the things that Lisa does is convey um, sort of the character of disability, which often makes anyone who's a caregiver around someone with a disability much more patient, much more understanding, in a way that often radiates out of your life to those around you. You can become emissaries of patience, of understanding, and in some ways exemplars of a kind of interaction with people who may face barriers and diminishment in their own lives. It's a beautiful aspect of her story, and it's one that she conveyed very crisply and not by accident. But how does this kind of storytelling fit into our overall advocacy? And I just wanted to share those six key components to effective advocacy so you can see what a cornerstone piece effective storytelling is. And you'll notice the first three, I try to create, try to say them in a way that's memorable. E-E-A-A-M-M. 
Again, take nothing away from today. Remember those three. Empirical evidence, anecdotal authority, and messenger-based media. Those are three absolutely key components to effective advocacy and, and powerful social movements, not coincidentally. And so you can see the anecdotal authority that good storytelling gives us and the ability to weave empirical evidence in with anecdotal authority. Oh my god, honey, now you're really talking some powerful stuff. Yes, that's like splitting the atom. When you can weave in advocacy with, when you can weave in anecdotes and storytelling with data, you can marshal data to help tell that story and you can interweave those together, you have something resembling the DNA of real political power. And if you can repeat that, and if you can teach that, and if you can inculcate that with colleagues at the local level, at the state level, and you can build that into uh, the architecture of a national social movement, you're really dealing with sustained power. So, three other elements there are also not uh, inconsequential. Uh, as Christian mentioned, and as I think many of the speakers yesterday reaffirmed, we're about building community. And that community, the cohesion and the solidarity that comes from that community is a powerful component of effective advocacy. Coalition, how you mobilize that community, how you outreach and develop uh, trade-offs and partnerships that are based on mutual interest, sometimes over a long period of time, with other patient advocates, with other health and consumer advocates, with labor allies, with business allies, particularly in small business. We heard about the power of small business advocates yesterday. Those coalition relationships are key and influence. Being in the arena, having political power. We also heard yesterday about the importance of primary election voters. Who do policymakers listen to? The people who vote in primary elections. Those regular voters, not just the people who show up like people coming into church on Easter and Christmas. No, the people who vote in every election who are always there. Those are the people who policymakers truly listen to because they know that their future re-election hinges on the loyalty of people who vote in those primary elections. So influence, knowing how to move people and voters and communicate that you have the ability to move voters, to show that you have the forces arrayed around you and can change primary outcomes or the perception of local policymakers in the media, that's influence, another key. So, with that, um, we want to move into a second component of today's activity, which is to help develop your own story. And to take not a ruthless eye, although ruthless eyes are sometimes called for in looking at our own stories, um, to take the example of Lisa's own story and use it as a means for crafting our own stories. How many of you actually did the homework and did prepare a version of your story um, for today? Yes, still <laughs> Brave Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Got plans for you, Helen. <laughs> anyone else? Did anyone else prepare a story? I'm not going to ask you to uh, read it cold, don't worry. But did anyone else follow the homework guideline and prepare a story? Okay. Well, in this case, we are actually going to look carefully then at Lisa's story, and we are going to find a way to practice storytelling amongst ourselves today. So as a jumping off point, let's hand around a version of Lisa's story. And we're going to use this. We're going to use this as something of a template in pairing off here today and to work on telling our own story. Now, this has a point for everybody, whether you are a clinician, whether you are a well-trained advocate, whether you are a frontline caregiver, 
uh, whether you are someone who is a survivor or a family member of a seated victim, everyone has a role in this, and I just want to encourage everyone, no matter how skilled or your walk of life or your entree point for seated advocacy, if you would take part in this uh, along with your fellow congregants here this morning in this exercise in story time. And I just want to ask if we can start with Cheryl, if we could count off ones and twos. And remember your number. Count off by ones and twos. One. So, so we'll start with one. Twos meet over here. So Vicky is going to be in the cluster of the twos, 
and the ones are going to be. Oh, oh, oh. Where you are, your location, ground zero <laughs> and two. And Cheryl, uh, you're going to be the ground zero for the ones. Okay. So move into the groups. And if you start looking at your fellow group members, find a fellow group member to pair off with. Okay? There's the one table. Well, the one Stay your ground, Eileen. I like that. One's over here, two's over here. Now, okay, find a fellow member of your group after you cluster, if you caucus as your group. Find a friendly, non-snarling member of your group. Helen, of course, does not qualify. <laughs> Find a fellow member of your group and pair off. And pair off. And, like the love birds that you are or might become, find a little niche in your area. Pair off with someone from your group as, as a duo, okay? Find a duo. I want to see duos everywhere, okay? No singletons. Everyone needs to be in a duo here. This is forced couple them, okay? The worst kind. But find a partner in your group, okay? Is everyone carrying off? Okay. You have an assignment. Okay. Once you find your partner, find a place where you can look at each other. Find a place where you have some degree of detachment. Use the risers over here. Use the couches and settees over here. Use this couch if you need to. That's only group number one. Just try to stick in your region of the of the room if you can. But pair off with your partner and in a way that you can maintain eye contact and easy listening with each other, take the next five minutes to tell one story and then turn the tables and take the next five minutes to have the other partner tell her his story. So the assignment is make a few notes, make a few notes, take five minutes to tell your story involving advocacy, involving CDIF or HAI advocacy, suffering, experience, do your best to incorporate some of what we talked about, beginning, middle, end. Some of you are very experienced in this already. Take this as an opportunity to show your colors or to own your story, and then do it the trade off, vice versa, and pass the mic proverbially to the other partner so that they can tell their story. Okay? Five minutes each, find a place, and let's make this happen.
Take a moment to wrap up your storytelling. And let's come back together as group two and group one. We're going to look, take a moment right now. How many of you, how many of you found this exercise one of the first times you thought critically about your own story? And let's be honest now, probably because this is a women-dominated group, we can be very frank about such things, about how our stories are sometimes undervalued. How many of you found this exercise one of the first things to attach great value to your story? Okay, well that's good. That means you, most of you realize what a precious asset you have in your storytelling. And I think we've taken some steps towards beginning that iterative process of honing your story here today. That's great. Who from group number two, let's start over here, um, would like to offer um, your story or that of your partner, if you feel like a confident retailer, sometimes it can be easier to do that and tell your own. Who here would like to share a story that you just sketch the outlines of or retold in a crisper way. And I won't pick on Helen despite my temptation to do so. <laughs> she knows I love I tease, I tease because I love. <laughs> I have no doubt. Um because if not we would have called Jayco on her actually. <laughs> um who here would like to tell a story? No, there's somebody. We'll get to you. We'll get to you. <laughs> April? No, we don't. That's fine. That's the whole value of what we're doing. Fabulous, April. Thank you. And uh, would you like to? Tell your story even when your voice shakes, right? Yeah. It's a beautiful reminder. Okay, my story starts in 2011. I started with a kidney stone. I went to the hospital and I contracted fever. A week later, I was back at the hospital in the ER. I was admitted. I had a temperature of 104 and I was having explosive diarrhea up to 30 times a day. And First thing they wanted to do was surgery. They wanted to remove the cord. And my brother-in-law is a doctor. He said, no, unless this results in a rich tumor, no, no, no. It wouldn't allow that to happen. My brother-in-law said if I had that happen, I probably wouldn't be here today to talk about it. So they put me on plateau first and vancomycin. Uh, I was in the hospital for eight days. Not a whole lot of but I wanted to go home. The doctor who released me had had to get it himself four times. He told me that I could look forward to having it again and again and again. It was pretty discouraging. Um, went home. I continued the way I was going. It was not well. I went back to my gastroenterologist um, several times. My brother-in-law told me about fetal transplant. He had been reading about it because of me. Found a place, um, it was just like it was at the time that he was in love, one was in Pittsburgh, and one was in Lima, Ohio, and I live in Atlanta, so I was ready to come here too. So I went back to my gastroenterologist, told him the news, and he actually knew the doctor in Lima County. He said for me to get into, he was doing a study, and for me to get into that study, I had to see a infectious disease doctor. So he sent me to an infectious disease doctor. So she got me into the study in Lima sent me there the following Monday, and I had to see Jane again the Monday after that, and it saved my life. Okay. I had it done by intubation. I had it in for three days, so it was then the first treatment, which we did it every six hours around the clock in the first treatment. I felt fabulous. Three days later, I was totally cured, and I have been in this cure ever since. Let's hear it from Ohioan.
Okay, uh, let's hear from group number one before we go into comments. Let's let that settle for a little bit. And let's hear from a willing volunteer. Okay. Um, I, my story is going to see that there's well, two members of my family. Uh, my mother in 2011 went into a cardiac ward for uh, heart disease. The lady, another lady in the ward, um, unbeknownst to us, was taken into isolation with C. diff. Uh, we were not informed and the woman was not uh, disinfected. My mother went home and developed a terrible diarrhea. And when we called the hospital, the nurse said, let her eat yogurt. Uh, we called the family doctor, who was of absolute no use at all. My mother was in an assisted living um, community. The visiting doctor there was of absolutely no use at all. Uh, it was left to our family to try and figure out what was going on. We eventually got the family doctor to prescribe Vagil, uh, and my mother did well, but uh, it kept recurring. And it kept recurring and recurring and recurring. She lived to three months of health. In the assisted living community, she was treated like a leper. She was confined to her suite. They would bring food to the door. Um, on rare occasions when anyone came in, they were gloved and covered head to toe. Uh, it was just the most devastating thing. And uh, eventually her body couldn't find it anymore and she died. And um, we thought that was the end of that. Uh, six weeks ago, my sister-in-law, who was on the other side of uh, the country, uh, wasn't doing very well. She went into uh, her family doctor. She, she had some stomach pain. She went into her family doctor who put her on Flagyl and Cipro. Um, some really bad symptoms arose, so she went to the emergency room. This took a couple of weeks. And the doctor said, did not test for fever. They gave her a colonoscopy and said she had ulcerative colitis and tried to see if she had got that. Um, she ended up in hospital. I had to come back from nursing her. Uh, she was in a really critical condition. Luckily, she went to another hospital. And um, the first thing they did was test for fever. Uh, we nearly lost her. It was really touch and go. She's right now just can't come off her medication. And we are praying that it's not going to reoccur. She's 53, she's in good health. Um, and I just said, this is not a turning point for me. It's time to get involved. I'm really tired of being inconsistent with the medical, medical um, knowledge. I'm tired of the cavalier attitude of the medical community and the hospital. And I am not going to take this on and that is a passion to get me to change. Well, let's just take a moment and uh, in as gentle and as collegial a way as possible, let's just take a moment to comment on the two stories we've just heard shared with us. Does, can anyone point to something that Cheryl did that April did not. Let me just make, let's just point to one distinction. Even between somewhat similar stories, your first-hand stories that had clarity and some degree of suspense in them, particularly in Cheryl, where she talked about reaching a point where they were left to their own devices. You, you felt the situation getting more and more desperate, which is key to creating a sense of Suspense. We can talk about suspense, but if you really want to create a compelling story, on top of the five ingredients listed there, you can add a sixth, suspense, to really um, make it poignant. But in any case, there was, a, there was one element that Cheryl glimpsed that April did not, and I just want to see if people honed in on that. She had a call to action, and yes, she could do something. Over what? It had, it had a relevant issue to it. She talked about the inconsistency of diagnosis and the inconsistency of treatment. That's exactly right. She okay. was in fact, she did not have, there, there was a rapid test that was performed to get accurate diagnostic equipment. She could be here today and not have to deal with any of that. Right. 
And uh, what did April's story have that Cheryl's did not? Somewhat more of a happy ending in the people's transplant for the cure. Right. Uh, so hers like had a solution. So it sounds more like she's you know positively asking the people to transplant as opposed right. to being against natural errors. Exactly right. There wasn't as compelling of an issue in April's story that she attached her narrative to. Um, which is something that I think was implicit in April's story. It was there to be brought forth a little bit more. Um, and again, it gets at what, how valuable an iterative process is. We can take that fecal transplant as offering a possibility and a home in on what issues are attached to that. Well, as we know, there are many issues attached to that, from testing to availability to even um, potential. A myriad of issues. Any one of which can be honed in on for the purposes of April's story, where April could be a very compelling advocate ushered to uh, a hearing or used in a first hand testimonial, direct mail, media. Um, you can imagine the, the uh, uses of it. But in any case, we saw, we heard two stories. Anyone else have noticed any distinctions or anything that uh, struck you in either one? or a distinction between the stories we just heard and Lisa's. One thing that was noteworthy about Cheryl's story was that she actually incorporated a very effective element that Lisa showcased earlier, which was talking about death not as the end of the story, but as the it's a catalyst for insight or lessons or policy action. Um, and that's a very effective bridge making that jump from your story and showing that individualized experience, a death or a treatment or whatever misdiagnosis, is not the end of the story, but is a bridge to action or remedying a pervasive situation or pervasive wrong through policy change or intervention or regulation. So any other insights? I mean, there was, um, when I felt the initial story, there was, um, there was a warmth in the way that she was telling it, uh, which I think is, uh, it felt like she was confiding uh, enough to some extent. Um, not that we could not also very long, but I think, like, you know, obviously she's a much polished storyteller, and doing this for quite some time. I, I think, you know, Cheryl did this almost more adversarial in the way that we in a process. Which might be 
very different than this detailed information she's giving that she's talking to a policymaker, you know, who she's trying to get to um, change the legislation for these testing or, you know, talking to an insurance company trying to get them to cover it. So, um, so I think that's a, that's a very good point to, you know, to know who you're talking to um, and to be comfortable enough with your own story to be able to tailor it to the situation. A perfect segue, um, because as Christian just said, he could go on for hours, and in fact he has <laughs> here in the Albany Times Union. Uh, we want to provide an example of how this kind of effective storytelling really is being put to use, and that the, the foundation is trying to model some of these best practices in our own advocacy. Um, and in the piece that ran on uh, the fifth anniversary of uh, Christian and Liam's um, mother's loss um, five years ago, this piece is a way of talking about breaking the silence about uh, feces and food in a very specific way around that anniversary. And it interweaves the story of her loss with that argument about the need to be open which is tactical on our part. What better way to deal with the discussion about feces than talking about motherhood? <laughs> it's actually a part of the strategy in making what is, for some audiences, and even for some journalists who cover gruesome stories in some cases, but get suddenly squeamish around talking about life-saving treatments involving or uh, devastated diseases and epidemics involving feces, um, the need to approach the subject openly. And so we did this very strategically in this story, and it worked very effectively. But this is an example of how to interweave a storytelling with some data, and how to help data draw some consistent use of data and talking points around prevalence of the disease, around how it's transmitted, around how it involves antibiotics. You know, it's not an easy story to tell, as many of you know. CETA does not submit to be conveyed in three talking points. Even our top line messages I just noticed yesterday involve nine messages. You kind of have to go through all these points to make the, to make the point of CETA plain to people. And so that's what we try to do in this op-ed. Um, I want to just uh, offer Lisa a chance uh, to talk about any Final comment she has. I, I know we're running over, so I don't want to take very much time, but I just want to reiterate that stories can be can serve many different purposes. And I think, as you said, the important thing before you tell your story is to think about the end and who your target is, what your message is, and how can you say it as quickly as possible. My, initially, when I first told my story, somebody asked me, like, what's going on at the very first conference I ever went to after Rory died? And I started telling them the story. And I was including every detail because I thought they would for sure want to know <laughs> everything about what happened. It was so egregious. And they looked at me and they said, you can't ever tell the story that way again. Nobody's going to believe you. No less will they have the time to listen. So over time, I've narrowed it down, and I now have sadly way too many stories that I can tell, but I've made them into individual stories, depending on what the purpose is. And that's really what I want to leave you with. Good luck to everybody. Um, I just want to leave you with the words of a little haiku I shared here on the worksheet. Uh, some of you know Michael Pollan, the author about plants, uh, who's become something of a guru around a healthy diet. And so you've probably heard his adage uh, around a healthy diet, which is eat a little, not too much, mostly plants. Well, uh, I shared a haiku here, which I hope, again, if you take nothing else away from this workshop, remember this uh, touchstone for advocacy of storytelling. Story plus data, build lists, but don't spam. Repeat, mostly first person. I leave that with you as a reminder that we tell stories, but we need to use the connections that we make through stories to capture our audience and to really capture our audience, to get the details, the contact information 
that we can keep in touch with people and use that bridge of empathy that we make to sustain a relationship with people. Databases also tell stories, are a way of capturing stories and a lot of the relationships that you have. So use your stories to build bridges but capture those connections. Make sure that you get the information of people who listen to you. When you head nods, Make sure you get that information. That's your responsibility as an advocate as well as telling the story, is to capture the information of all the people you talk to so that they can, that you can maintain that touch and as advocates, you can move those people at strategic times when you need to mobilize them around the policy issue or around legislation or both, or even around elections. So remember to capture information even as you're dispensing it. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.